Morning, everybody. I'm Nick Slavic. I'm the proprietor of the Nick Slavic Painting and Restoration Company. I'm also the host of this program, Ask a Painter Live. It's a weekly Facebook Live segment where you send in your questions about painting and otherwise, and I answer them using my over two decades of painting, restoration, wood finishing, wallpaper, decorative finishing experience. So uh, uh, today <laughs> I am coming to you from Pewaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, my intention today, uh, a fellow contractor uh, through my Facebook Live uh, segment, Ask a Painter, had asked me to do sort of a treatise on paint shine, where to use it, what is it, uh, how, do we, how do we use it, things like that. Uh, when I was in the uh, midst of preparing that certain uh, presentation, I actually got a call from the National PDCA, the Painting and Decorating Contractors of America, uh, to come in and fill in for a speaker who couldn't make it at the Wisconsin Council State Convention. So, I am here in Wisconsin. Uh, the, the poor fella who uh, was supposed to be here is actually down in Florida. Flights are all canceled, obviously, because of the hurricane. So, within 24 hours notice, uh, I combed through my, uh, my list of presentations. Uh, I tailored uh, um, six hours worth of lectures uh, to this specific group and flew to, Mil uh, flew to Milwaukee, drove to Pewaukee, and here I am in the uh, Country Springs um, Hotel and uh, Convention Center. So, um, instead of talking about shine today, I thought I would cover just some basics of interior painting. Um, <clears throat> interior wall painting, to be more specific. Um, I get a lot of questions about uh, certain kind of paint, certain kind of this and that, but more important is almost the tools you do and the process you use and things like that. Uh, because this is short notice, we're gonna we're gonna go into this, just kind of you know hit all the tops of all the uh, peaks and valleys here, and uh, and cover a lot of the basics uh, this morning, guys. Uh, because this is on short notice, send all your questions. Uh, I'd be happy to go through and answer any of that stuff for you this morning here. Um, uh, this is definitely a topic that we're going to go into depth uh, at another time, but this is probably the most common homeowner uh, job to tackle as far as painting goes. Uh, cabinets are kind of all the rage to do, but again, like I mentioned in, uh, in my last one, it is probably technically the most difficult painting job out there to do. Um, not according to HGTV, obviously but because uh, <laughs> uh, that's basically all they do on that show. Uh, but it, it is very difficult and uh, we, we sort of did a treatise on it uh, on the last episode or two here and uh, you can certainly go back and look at those. So um, <clears throat> again, like I said, guys, any question at all, doesn't have to be interior painting, send it on to me this morning. Uh, it's been a long couple days for me here. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, I met a lot of people. Uh, these contractors that I meet here are, are always inspiring people and I, and I always enjoy uh, talking with them and uh, gaining perspective with the industry. So let's talk about some basic interior painting stuff. Uh, most of the time, an interior painting project is brought on by the need to just change color. Uh, the outside of a house, it may be peeling, it may be fading, uh, there may be something going wrong with the paint, a failure. Inside, you rarely ever see a paint failure. Most of the time, it's brought on by a color change. So, as long as we keep walls clean, uh, as long as there's no water damage, technically, a wall paint could last for 100 years. But, because we live in these houses, we have lots of labs running around, we have lots of kids running around, uh, the walls kind of take a beating. So. Uh, this brings on an interior painting project. Uh, the basic supplies for interior painting. Um, and this, uh, <laughs> perspective is a great thing. And, and the PDCA, this national painters group that I'm, that I'm in, offers me a lot of perspective. Uh, when I started my own business 10 years ago, I sort of grew up on an island. You know, think about those flightless birds on those islands that sort of evolve all by themselves with no outside influence. And then somebody discovers them, and then all of a sudden there's this weird thing that, that uh, people are kind of curious about. Well, that's, that's sort of what I've done with my business. Since painters are lone sharks, I've sort of evolved my own methods of doing things, um, sort of based on whatever worked and what was available to me at the time. So. In the paint, uh, with, with professional painters, there's always a big debate. Guys love to talk about brands of brushes, uh, but even more so, guys love to talk about using a roller pan versus a five gallon bucket with one of those metal roller screens in there that you, uh, you, you know, rub your roller on like that. For the basic interior painting project, if you're just gonna do one bathroom, one bedroom, to me, five gallon bucket roller screen is kind of overkill. Um, a pan, and, and Use this for perspective. I think I'm in the minority because I still use pan. A lot of professional painters see guys who use a roller pan and a roller handle like that as sort of you know homeowner stuff, uh, as somebody who doesn't know enough. 
Um, I really like it. it. It's a very efficient way to, to paint. Now, imagine if you're just doing a small accent wall and you only need a quart of paint, dumping that quart of paint into the bottom of a five gallon bucket and trying to get that you know roller, nine inch roller down in there, um, rolling it against the screen, I don't think you can effectively you know really use all that paint. With a roller pan, um, there's a nice deep well, at least the ones I use, they're usually you know a couple inches thick like this. Uh, you can get all the paint right there and all of it can be used. You know, <clears throat> there's no corners where you can't get in, things like that, and certainly professionals weigh in. Um, this may have changed over the years, but uh, whenever I hear a debate about this topic, um, you know, guys kind of look down on the, on the roller tray guys. I don't, I, that's all I use. Um, now, if I'm doing a very large project or if I'm doing tons of ceilings in a house, I actually use those uh, Wooster green plastic buckets. They're square buckets. Uh, I have one that's the 18 inch one. Uh, I have one that's the regular nine inch one, but they're really deep. They can hold about four or five gallons of paint when you really dump them in there. And when I'm doing, uh, like I said, large ceilings, uh, tons of wall, you know, priming an entire new house, new construction, I'll use that because it's got, you know, three, four gallon capacity and I can just go, 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 go. Uh, I usually use one of those furniture dollies uh, put underneath it so I can just kind of roll it around and, and do that. But it's really overkill if you're doing one bathroom, one bedroom. So I just like the roller tray. It's something where if you're in a bathroom, you can put it on top of the ladder, uh, roll a little bit like that. Um, you know, if you're, if you're in a tough area over a shower. So my basics are a uh, roller tray, a deep one. Uh, they sell a lot of those real skinny ones like this, and those are prone to spilling over the edge. So uh, in the industry in the last couple years, there used to be three. There used to be the skinny ones like this uh, with a real thin gauge metal. Uh, there used to be some medium ones, which are probably two inches thick, which were my favorite. And then there were the monsters, you know, the ones that were three, four inches thick. They're wider, they're longer, they're sort of unwieldy sometimes. Um, in the industry, those middle versions, the, the, uh, the bowl porridge that is just right for me, uh, actually started going away. So, uh, you can still find versions of it here and there. I can only get one readily available one, uh, and I believe it's from Wooster. Uh, I do have a bunch of those big pans. I definitely never use the smaller pans, but get, get yourself a pan, a metal one too. Don't use the plastic ones. Uh, they're not that much more expensive with a nice deep lip. So when you do pour in a half a gallon of paint uh, and you're moving it around, you, you're not spilling over the edge. Um, roller handles. Uh, my favorite is the Wooster Sherlock. It's got the hunter green handle, the super thick gauge. It's almost like quarter inch rod, uh, stainless steel metal that goes up to a really uh, reinforced uh, hunter green plastic uh, thing for the roller. And those are super stiff. Um, in normal use, you can't bend those things. They're, they're just a great roller, super stiff. They transfer a lot of energy, you know, from your hands, from the pole onto the wall like that. Um, and uh, they seem to be very, I, I have not bent one in normal use yet. Now, when you get some of those uh, lesser ones where they got a thin plastic handle, usually black, they got a thin gauge, and then they have sort of like four wires that go uh, in, inside the roller sleeve. A lot of times, if you're really pressing on something like that, you'll just flex that thing right down there and, and sort of close pin itself on itself. So um, not my favorite. Again, uh, you can get one of these uh, Wooster Sherlock's. I think at my uh, local Ace Hardware, they sell them for under 10 bucks, and obviously I can get a little better price with a contractor's discount, but for 10 bucks, that thing will last you the rest of your life. You, if you clean it up, if you, uh, if you store it uh, where the bearings don't rust in it, that thing uh, you will use for the rest of your life and probably hand down to your grandkids. Um, so we covered uh, metal pan uh, and that thing too. I mean, I can get uh, at the normal start of the interior season, you know, I'll get uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 roller handles. I'll get uh, between 10 and 20 of those metal pans, and I can usually get two years worth of interior painting out of those. I wash them all after every time I use them. I know that's another big debate in the painters community, um, especially with roller roller sleeves too. Um, and I guess we could probably talk about that now too. Um, I am a big fan of the uh, uh, of a very high quality. Uh, uh, my, my kind of go-to is the, uh, the Wooster Pro Dew Z. Um, it's a very high quality roller cover. I've seen them anywhere from eight bucks down to about five bucks. Uh, and it's a very good cover and, and, and don't skimp on this stuff too. This is the one area. If you want to save a little money, maybe get a plastic tray, maybe get a lesser roller handle, but for the love of God, don't get a cheap roller head, uh, roller sleeve. Um, the cheaper you go, uh, the less fluff, the less nap is going to be on it, and it's not going to go as far. And the biggest problem with the cheap roller heads is they shed. 
and you're gonna ruin your walls. If you get one of those three packs of homeowner stuff, a generic brand, this and that, um, you will leave fuzz all over your walls. And uh, it's very hard to get off. Even when it's dry, you could sand it, you could scrape it off, there's still remnants left behind. Very difficult to do. So just for, for a couple more dollars, you can get the best uh, roller heads, uh, roller sleeves on the market. And uh, normally my go-to is a half inch. Uh, and I might be in the minority in this too. Whenever I see guys list their uh, favorite roller roller covers, you know, Purdy and Wooster are usually at the top. I've used both, they're both very good. It's just uh, that I can get uh, the Wooster stuff readily available uh, a little closer to me. Um, a, a lot of the debate revolves around 3 8 and uh, 1 quarter inch nap rollers. And I see a lot of professionals using those, which is a little surprising to me because in my in my experience using those, they don't go very far. Uh, as a matter of fact, for, for the first maybe five years of my business, all I used was three quarter inch nap roller covers. So they're, they're quite thick, they have a lot of fluff, but they would go forever. Uh, I have since sort of uh, moved that back a little. Uh, I found that the half inch gave, uh, gave the wall a little less stipple uh, like that. So if you're doing a small room, if you're doing one bathroom with an eggshell or a satin paint where it's gonna be a little shinier, uh, a half inch uh, roller cover actually did uh, a little bit better than the three quarter, especially when you're maneuver around vanity lights and switch plates and things like that. But uh, my, st you know, for priming new construction or something like that, I'll definitely go for maybe a three quarter because you can just go forever uh, on that stuff. And uh, so yeah, um, I'm a, I'm a big fan. I carry a regular supply. I usually carry about 20 half inch roller heads and maybe about 15 to 20 three quarter inch. Um, if you're doing something thicker, if you got a hand troweled plaster wall uh, inside, or if you got some, you know, a stucco-like texture in there, three quarters is all you need. There's really no reason to go any thicker than that inside. Um, the only exception might be ceilings. If you have a very, very uh, rough popcorn or acoustic uh, cottage cheese ceiling, uh, depending on where you are in the country, they go by different names. Sometimes I'll step up to maybe a you know, three quarter would probably be the minimum that usually gets by. If you have to go inch and a quarter, uh, which is a very, very thick one, uh, that's okay too. But uh, you run the risk of doing a lot of uh, splatter and kind of drips and, uh, and, and not getting a very even job. So, uh, roller heads, uh, brushes. Brushes are, <laughs> uh, at least in the professional painter circles, guys love to talk about their favorite brushes. And it's sort of, you know, Chevy Ford sort of thing. Um, I have not, uh, of the high-end brands, if we're talking Corona, Wooster, Purdy, you know, all the other high-end brands like that, I have not really used a lot of bad brushes. It's, it's, it has to do with a lot of personal preference. So guys will swear by Chevy, they'll swear by Purdy, they'll swear by Wooster, uh, and I don't know, I, I don't give it that much credence. As long as you're buying that high echelon of brush, uh, my normal uh, trim brush, my go-to is, uh, is a Purdy Alasco which is a two and a half inch uh, straight cut brush. And we'll, we'll talk about that later. That's a little uh, point of contention with a lot of people. Um, it's got a nice long, thick handle. So, uh, you know, your hands don't tire out. The thicker the handle on the brush, the less you, uh, your hands tire out that I found out. So it's, it's actually, you know, in a normal paintbrush, you have sort of a beaver tail handle or a stubby handle like this. This Alasco probably has, you know, eight or nine inches worth of handle there. So when you have to reach that little, that little extra, when you're on a stairwell in one of those two story entryways and you just got to reach a little farther, that'll give you another, you know, six or eight inches of reach. And that could mean one less ladder move in there. Um, and the, it, it is the Purdy Pro Extra uh, Alasco. It's got the blue tinted uh, bristles on it. It's a great brush. They clean up phenomenally for whatever reason. Uh, you know, if I wash them out at the end of every day and boy, the paint comes right out of them. It's a, it's a great bristle. They're, uh, they're fine enough where you don't get a lot of brush marks, but they're also stiff and uh, durable enough where I can use those brushes for about one year. What I do is I start off, uh, I buy about 20 or 30 of those brushes at the start of the interior season. Use those all winter, they're nice and broken in, and then I ended up using them for, uh, in the summer for uh, you know, some exterior trim and stuff like that. Normally by the end of the summer, they're kind of wore out. You know, one year of, of use in those things is usually enough. Uh, but certainly if, if, if you're just doing homeowner projects, if you buy one of those pretty Alaskos or, and I, I and I, Wooster has plenty of good offerings. I have uh, similar brushes that I like there. Again, it's just a, it's a function of what can I get quick what can I get readily and uh, what's a good price for me at a contractor? So I, I use both interchangeably. Uh, I have my uh, brush tote that I actually custom made. It's a, it's a blue rubber made tote and it's actually got um, 
uh, rods in there that hold the brushes up and down and suspends them in this box to keep the bristles good. And I have about six different manufacturers of brushes in there. So I am not uh, particular to one brand. It just so happens that for that process, that's the brush I use. Now, um, washing them out, uh, there's a big uh, debate <laughs> in, the, in the professional painters community. I'd love to hear you professionals chime in. Uh, lots of guys like to make spreadsheets on is it more economical to throw them out at the end of the day or wash them. Um, I'm always of the mentality of waste not, want not. And yes, it takes a little while to clean out your brushes and your roller heads, but for me, just cosmically, <laughs> it, it seems wasteful to throw out a perfectly good roller head that could give you six months of service, even if it does take some of your effort to clean it out. Uh, brushes as well, too. Those are a big investment. And, uh, you know, in, in my brush tote, there could be a thousand bucks worth of brushes in there. And if you just throw those out after every use, that, that's pretty wasteful to me. So, uh, and like I said, as a homeowner, if you buy one of those purdies, if you get a couple of Wooster roller heads and stuff, that'll basically last you the rest of your life uh, painting your house. I mean, I could, uh, I would imagine that uh, one of those purdy Alaskos, you could probably paint about eight or nine complete houses with those things before you start to see a fall off uh, in, in wear and durability and things. So, okay. Um, drop cloths. Uh, a lot of homeowners like to take the bed sheet and drag it around with them. Uh, they, <clears throat> they may stop the drips, but they, they don't stop them from soaking through and you, and you may get a little bleed through onto your carpet. So painters, tarps, uh, canvases are actually fairly cheap. And again, if you spend 50 bucks, uh, you can get about four inexpensive canvas runners and that will basically cover the perimeter of a bedroom like that. And certainly you can use plastic to cover the bed and uh, I'm not a big fan of plastic on the floor, mainly because if you drip on plastic, uh, it doesn't absorb and you can step on it and then track it wherever you want. The, the point of using canvas is uh, the canvas will soak up the drip, it's thick enough where it won't go through to the carpet, but it'll also dry it out then so you're not tracking it all over the place. So. Um, f about four of those long runners, I think they're usually four feet by about somewhere between 10 and 14 feet long. Those will easily cover uh, the standard bedroom or bathroom. And, and again, those will last you the rest of your life. And uh, you, can, you can hand them down to your grandkids too. Um, my favorite ladders, uh, I use when I can. I always use the smallest ladder I possibly can for the job. A six foot step ladder is way overkill uh, for the standard eight, eight and a half foot room. Uh, it places you up too high and you don't have access to enough of the wall. My favorite over the last couple years has just been the, the standard Werner four foot fiberglass ladder like that. Uh, in, a, in a standard bedroom or bathroom, uh, when you stand on there, the, uh, the paint can that you can set on top or hang off the side uh, is about at waist height. That's about good. You have full access to the wall if you need it in front of you, and it's not that far of a reach. And uh, it's, it's, it doesn't become unwieldy in a bedroom. It's got a nice uh, skinny footprint, so when you move the bed and the dressers in the middle of the room, uh, on the best case scenario, normally you have two or three feet around the outside, and that sucker will just maneuver right around all that stuff. So, so um, if you can get a four foot, if you got a five foot, I, I use those too, but uh, for the standard eight or nine foot ceiling height, I like a four foot. Uh, seems to give you a little more maneuverability. Um, another little trick that I use is a chain hook uh, for your can. They sell them at uh, hardware stores. Uh, I've seen them anywhere as cheap as a buck, or maybe as expensive as four or five bucks. Uh, it's basically a, just a couple lengths of chain, kind of a clevis or a snap hook, and then a nice round half hook, and it's usually stainless steel. Um, you, hook, uh, you hook the clevis part onto the handle of the can, and then the hook uh, can go on the rung of an extension ladder. Uh, on a lot of newer uh, Werner ladders and stuff, they actually have large, large bore holes uh, put in the top, so you can actually hook that chain over. And then I set the can not in the front of the ladder or the, or the back of it where you, where you walk, but over the side. I, I hang it over the side. That way I'm not leaning into it. Uh, and when it's on the front of the ladder, sometimes it hangs down underneath and, and it's, uh, you can't get the brush in there. Um, so yeah, basically that's, uh, that will make your life easier. That's, that's sort of the basic, um, uh, the basic tools that you'll need. Uh, my process for painting an interior room, um, to me, uh, there's usually some nail holes to fix. There's a new construction nowadays. There's almost always nail pops, um, tape, uh, drywall tape in the corners, uh, is coming loose. I found that a lot too. Uh, the, the quality of drywall has gone down in the last 10 to 20 years so far that, um, these houses that are less than 10 years old have major flaws, major cracks, tons of nail pops. It looks like a machine gun went up and down the wall. So I spend a lot of time fixing that. Uh, when you see homes built, you know, 1985 and earlier, uh, the drywall mud seemed to be a little harder. 
Uh, even though they use nail on the nails on the drywall to hold it up instead of screws, it seems that that stuff stuck better. So whether that's a function of better framing lumber, better drywall, more stable drywall, a harder mud that doesn't move as much or susceptible to pops, I don't know. But the older houses seem to have much harder, much more durable walls with less flaws. The newer stuff, especially nowadays, that I've even seen uh, on construction sites, you know, extra lightweight drywall, which is sort of interesting to me, uh, extra lightweight mud, and then guys even water that down further so it spreads on uh, as thin as possible. And it's very easily to sand. So again, uh, you guys know my treatise. It's sort of, is it better for the homeowner or is it better for you as the contractor? And uh, that, the state of drywall now is completely a function of these guys running downhill saying, I am going to make this as easy for me as a contractor as possible, homeowner be damned. And uh, I end up going back and fixing a lot of stuff. Uh, even in new construction, I find myself spending about a whole day patching brand new drywall on a house because of flaws, either sanding flaws, uh, pinholes in the stuff, areas that were missed. It just, it, it's the state of drywall right now. I've seen it in $2 million homes. I've seen it in tracked apartment houses. It's all the same. It's the state of the industry. So you're going to see a lot of flaws. Uh, what I do is I take one of those halogen work lights uh, with an extension cord and I hold it sideways against the wall. So if you have your wall here, I hold it so it's shining like this. And <laughs> it's, uh, it's like the Shroud of Turin. If you, if you hold it the right way, stuff just pops out at you like that. If you take a, a uh, light and shine it straight at the wall like this, you can't see the shadows. Uh, so if you shine it sideways across the wall like that, uh, you'll see every little flaw. You'll see where the stipple is thicker than the other stuff. Uh, and I go wall by wall. Uh, my process is starting at the door wall when you walk into a bedroom or a bathroom. That's sort of a, a, a systematic way of starting and stopping. Uh, I go wall by wall and start patching. Uh, I, because we have to turn these bedrooms out uh, quickly every day, uh, I like to start or I like to finish what I start in a day. Um, I need those patches to dry quickly. So two ways I do this. Um, I do not use standard drywall mud because uh, that'll take a little while to, to dry. What I do is I use a vinyl spackle. Uh, which is a, a quick drying mud and uh, it, it also sands very easily. Usually within about 15 or 20 minutes a standard patch can be dry enough to sand and then to paint over and it's stable enough too. Uh, I don't feel like I'm giving up a lot of, uh, there's a lot of products on the market that are spongy and styrofoamy and you can patch something but you don't feel like if you put your finger on it you could probably poke it right through the wall again. Uh, with this stuff, it's, it's a heavy, dense stuff that, that sort of half dry already in the bucket, so when you put it on, it dries very quickly. I put it on with just a simple stainless steel two and a half inch putty knife. Um, a little trick that I use uh, as a professional is uh, I, I tint my mud because uh, it comes pure white and a lot of times on lighter walls you, you won't be able to see your patches. So what I do is I take chalk from a chalk line uh, that carpenters use, you know, the line that you, you uh, dispense out and you snap it and it's got different colored chalks there. I use the blue tint, uh, never use the red tint. The red tint bleeds through paint, bleeds through drywall mud, everything else. Um, <clears throat> the blue uh, will tint that mud. I, I tint it, you know, baby blue, uh, half the tint of the sky. And you can see all your blue patches around there. If you tint it too much, a light paint won't cover that blue. But uh, if you tint it just barely, you'll be able to see all your patches. And that's a huge help. Uh, the second way I get these things to dry quicker is I have two industrial box fans for every room that I paint. So I get them circulating around in a motion. Um, one, po one pointing this way on one wall, one pointing this way on the other wall, and they just circulate uh, air throughout there. And I find that these patches dry extremely quick. Uh, even when you have something about the size of a dime uh, on the wall, you can usually get that thing to dry within about a half an hour. Uh, another thing, if you have to, a hair dryer or a heat gun will also uh, dry those out quickly. Not a big fan of that stuff. Anytime you push something too quick to dry, it usually loses something in it. Uh, durability, hardness, stability, uh, maybe it'll shrink a little bit. If I don't have to do this, I don't. I don't find myself doing it very often. Uh, it, it may not affect the quality of the mud, but I'm not gonna take a chance like that. So uh, my goal for every room is to uh, get those patches drying. So in order to get patch on the wall, what I have to do first is uh, me, and, me and my apprentices, we first move all the furniture immediately canvas everything. One huge canvas goes over all the furniture in the middle, four runners around the outside, and then I, I or my senior apprentice start patching right away. You gotta get those patches dry. Before we do tape, before we do switch plates, before we, uh, anything else like that, uh, we, we get those patches going. So I or one of my senior guys takes the light around with a bucket of mud and patches, 
while the other guy either tapes or takes off switch plates. I usually leave switch plates till the end only because it's sort of a filler job, doesn't take any skill, so if we're waiting for mud to dry at that time, we can take off some switch plates. Uh, but yeah, normally the process goes, uh, I or my senior apprentice will mud, um, and then whoever else is left will, will be taping and, and doing other prep stuff. Uh, and like I said, with the fans always moving. Uh, <laughs> my guys are, are fairly used to, to telling me, uh, to hearing me say that uh, there should never be a dead fan on a job site. If, if we bring a fan into a house, that sucker should be blasting at high speed no matter what. Um, so, taping the woodwork. Um, my, my normal process, I've experimented over the years and I've gone back and forth with a lot of this stuff. Um, uh, very low end apartment painters will use tan tape. Um, most painters use blue tape. Uh, I use the green frog tape. It seems to be a very good product. Um, I, I like the, I think it's referred to as three quarter or, or less than one inch uh, frog tape. It's the thinnest green frog tape they sell. If you get it on the baseboards well and, and you have it, you don't press it all the way down onto the baseboard, you leave it straight out perpendicular to the baseboard, uh, it actually covers the whole baseboard and your, your canvas drop cloth will sneak up to the baseboard and you actually create a little zone of safety like that so the paint drips don't hit it. Um, I, I, my normal process for uh, taping, I have a cleaning brush in one hand, I have a painter's tool in the other, and I, I clean off uh, the baseboards there uh, make sure there's no dust, make sure they're free of grease, uh, dirt, oil, things like that. Um, I apply the tape. I usually uh, break off a piece about uh, as long as my arms will go. Uh, adhere with my fingers, sort of press it down, uh, and then I use the painter's tool at the end to sort of, uh, you know, just finally get in that little crease because where the wall meets the baseboard, there's going to be a tiny gap there uh, where your finger can't get in there. At least my fingers can't get in there. So I use the edge of the painter's tool held at a 45, and I just crease that tape finally to press that edge down. Uh, and, and with the frog tape, it's got a chemical on, on both edges where uh, water coagulates or liquid coagulates when it hits it. Uh, so uh, if you press that edge down well enough, uh, most of my rooms, at least the goal for all my rooms, is to have no uh, bleed through on any of the baseboards and things like that. So um, after the taping's all done, um, normally then at that time, you know, we would do uh, switch plates, take off all the switch plates. Uh, and then the room, uh, basically, if the patches are dry, uh, you know, you're ready to paint. Uh, and again, I systemize it by starting at the door wall uh, and, and going clockwise uh, all the time. Uh, and, and for me, with my apprentices, we normally work in uh, teams uh, where one person cuts, one person rolls right behind them. The goal of that is to keep a wet edge on the paint uh, so you don't have any lap marks and, and to continually get the paint on as quick as you can so it can dry. Um, if you're doing it by yourself, do one wall at a time. Uh, there's a tendency with homeowners to uh, cut or, or brush all the borders of, of everything in the room and uh, worst case scenario I've even seen homeowners say well I, I just cut the room twice right away so I could be done and then I can just do the easy stuff the rolling later and what you'll get is actually called picture framing where uh, you've already built up uh, two layers of shine in the in the border areas and then you come back and uh, and you roll two coats over the top there and what happens is you're gonna have uh, areas where there's uh, four coats where they overlap and two coats next to the corners and then two coats rolling there. So um, do it and try to keep a wet edge. Cut and roll at the same time. Uh, if, you're, if you're doing it like, uh, by yourself, like I said, uh, cut one wall and roll one wall all at the same time. Um, like I said, I start at the door wall. Systemize uh, your, your painting so you don't forget what you are. I use the, the door that you enter the room in as my starting and stopping point all the time just because when I set my apprentices free on those things, if they're on walls that are two walls over from the door wall, I know where they are in the room, and if, and if anything goes wrong, you can, you can find some other thing that went wrong. Um, like I said, fans, keep the fans moving. Um, and when you finish your first coat, then it's time to start looking for imperfections. Uh, a lot of times if you use a very high grade paint that's an eggshell or a satin, um, once you put your first coat on, you're, you're gonna start seeing the flaws come from either the last painter or flaws that you missed. Uh, whether it be uh, excessive stipple. Uh, sometimes there's a bunch of fuzz from somebody who used a cheap roller cover, maybe a patch that you missed, maybe a patch that needs a little more sanding. At that time, uh, take that time to fix all those and uh, you, you can even touch those up with paint before the second coat. Um, and then the second coat the same way, just observe proper drying times. If you're in any question, read the technical data sheets and see uh, what, the, what it allows for recoat times. Um, most interior paints are two hours, give or take. Usually not a big deal uh, when, uh, when you're moving at a production rate. Uh, sometimes you have to slow down and wait uh, for the paint to dry. 
sometimes you can, uh, if I have a, a small amount of rooms, you know, maybe two or three rooms to do in a day, a lot of times I'll pump up the heat in the people's house just to aid in the drying. Still observing drying times, but just seems to recoat better. Um, when you're done with your second coat, uh, and almost always two coats, uh, there's a lot of paints nowadays that market themselves as paint and primer in one. I am not a believer in that at all. Uh, even some of the very high-end paints say uh, even the darkest, deepest, brightest colors cover in one coat. And even though it may, I don't know many people who can do one perfect coat in a room every day for the rest of their life. So um, what I found is that even if you can do, if you're that one person who can put a perfect coat uh, of paint on a wall in a room, um, it's still not going to build uh, the proper shine. Uh, the second coat, uh, if you're going over builder's paint, which is a very flat, porous paint, what you'll see is that first coat will, will soak in very much and, and the shine will actually be quite a bit less than if you're painting over a wall with already eggshell or satin paint. Uh, so if you only do one coat there, you're going to see a lot of picture framing in the corners where that paint overlaps the brushed areas and the rolled areas. Um, <clears throat> So that way, uh, the second coat actually evens out that shine and, and gives you a nice wear layer. Um, as soon as you're done uh, painting the room, I take the tape off immediately. While that paint, where the, where the wall meets the tape baseboard or the casing there, while the paint is still soft, it'll come off easier. If you wait for it to dry, sometimes you have the tendency to peel some paint off the wall too. Uh, if that's the case, you just take a razor knife and just kind of lightly score it. But um, most of the time, if you get it while it's still soft, it comes right off. And uh, if you use the frog tape or, or something the like, uh, 3M has their edge lock as well. Um, usually if you tape it right, there's no touch-ups in the room, which is kind of the goal. Um, uh, after, after all the tape comes off, uh, then we apply the switch plates as soon as the, the paint is uh, dry enough so we don't glue them to the wall. And then we, we, uh, we get our uh, canvas out of the way. Uh, so we're basically left with a completely painted room, switch plates on, tape off, but furniture still in the middle. That's when we vacuum up around the edges. Most people don't have uh, or the time or, or have ever sort of vacuumed behind furniture. I take this time uh, to vacuum up behind it. It's sort of a nice thing. People appreciate it. We move all the furniture back, set it all up again, and then we paint, uh, or excuse me, we, we vacuum up in the middle again where, where the furniture sat. And then we sort of back ourselves out. I usually leave a fan on in the room if there's one, just to sort of aid in the dissipation of the paint fumes, uh, the VOCs. Um, if the paint's dry enough, we'll hang the curtains again. If not, we'll, we'll put the brackets in and just leave them instructions uh, as, to, as to put them on. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. I'm going to scroll through your questions here. What are the different types of cabinets that you can come across? Uh, and Jose, why don't you expound on that a little bit? Um, uh, if you're talking profiles, wood species, uh, things like that, let me know if there's something more specific I can answer with that. Yeah, sorry about the camera, guys. I had it sideways. It didn't. Um, it didn't flip over my way. So. And the questions still are uh, coming sideways here. Let's see if I can. What is the trick to getting edges when two colors meet to get the non-bleeding perfect line? Is there a gadget? No, uh, there is no gadget. Um, they, they sell a lot of those sort of uh, paint pads, paint sponges. Some of them have wheels on them. Some of you attach to poles, some not. And uh, none of those do a great job. Um, sadly, the best way to do it is uh, have experience with a brush and you can actually cut a straight line. If you're doing an accent wall in a bedroom, say the wall behind the headboard, um, what you'll find is that the, the corner, uh, if you're going to do just that one wall, there's two inside corners there. What you'll find is that those corners are not razor sharp straight. When you get up close and inspect them, there's a lot of this like that. So the technique is uh, with a very good brush, and that's probably the best uh, uh, tip I can give you, is that the better the brush you get, the, the finer the bristles are going to be at the end. It's called flagging, and it will actually produce a finer line. So. When you're in a corner, uh, I normally, uh, I hand brush those things when I can because sometimes you have to go over a bump and sometimes, you know, when the walls dip and curve, you have to make the straight line through those. Now, um, obviously a lot of us don't have uh, a lot of years uh, of experience doing that. So the easiest thing I can tell you to do is uh, frog tape makes a uh, delicate surface tape. It's a yellow tape. I, I know that 3M has their version of that too. Uh, but it's a very thin 
uh, tape, uh, but it also has the chemical on the edge. What I will do is actually tape off that sometimes when I'm teaching my new apprentices. If it's a fairly straight wall, uh, I will tape off that corner, and what you'll find is that because of the imperfections in the wall, you're only gonna get maybe one or two areas where paint kind of seeps under a little bit. It's not a function of the tape or the painter, it's just that the walls are uneven. Uh, and at the end, then you just take the, the neutral color on the other three walls and just touch up those two little places. And most of the time, that's a, that's a really good way to do it. And depending on the wall, if the walls are, it depends on the light, it depends on the color, but sometimes I find myself taping those corners only because uh, it's a very highly visible place and, uh, and the walls are straight and I'll get that nice razor line. Most of the time though, I find myself just hand cutting them. Uh, you let the paint dry and then you, know, you kind of stand over one way look at it, stand over the other way look at it, and you'll be able to tell where it needs to be touch up. And sometimes it's just a function of making as straight a line as you can in the corner and then coming back and just touching up a few areas where you maybe you know, went out of bounds with it a little bit. So. That's the best advice I can give you for that. There is no gadget for that. Uh, if there was, uh, all the professionals would use it, but here we are with rollers and very high quality brushes, and uh, it's basically just patience and skill. So I hope that, hope that helps. <laughs> and Jim Barrett, uh, you and Eve, tell me how you guys are doing down there with the hurricane. Uh, it looks, looks pretty interesting on the, uh, on the news there. Sorry guys, I gotta tilt this just for a second to read these um, comments. That hasn't flipped around yet. Wet down the brush before starting will help it clean better. Always use a comb. The water and the oil can clean faster. Um, that's something that I've heard a lot of people say. I've never done it. Uh, normally about uh, you know three dips in the can and three applications of the wall with a brush, my brushes are sort of warmed up. But I have heard that from people uh, doing various things with their brushes to make them easy to clean. But I found that uh, uh, instead of any uh, tricks like that, uh, which I do appreciate, uh, just cleaning them out as quick as you can after you're using them seems to be the best way, at least in, uh, in, in my mind, to, to keep those brushes good. Uh, Kevin, the new LED light are rechargeable, nice and new. Um, there was actually a homeowner uh, that I used, though, her son was actually a sales rep for those and she had a bunch of them in the house and they're really cool. They're very compact. Think of basically the standard yellow halogen work light like this, only it was very small, maybe the size of a, a baseball or a softball like that and had some LEDs. It was a very good, uh, I like the concept because it was rechargeable, you weren't carrying that cord around. Uh, the only problem was it was a very bright one and it only lasted about an hour. So I'm hoping that with battery and LED technology, these things come along and they can be a little, uh, a little bit better with that. Uh, Cause I would certainly like to ditch all those, you know, uh, those ones with a very expensive <laughs> halogen light bulbs inside and, and they're just rickety piles of tin and they always fall apart. You know, we have a tote full of them and they just, I find myself, you know, once every week or two changing on all those halogen bulbs and, and the bulbs are more expensive than the actual uh, lights themselves. I'm, I, I'm all on board as soon as those things get, uh, you know, for about an hour uh, that I found there, uh, for about an hour of use, you know, you're spending 80 bucks for one of those things and, uh, and recharging it. So I'm just hoping that that, uh, that comes down a little bit the way technology does. All right, see what else we got here. <laughs> Enjoy your tips, uh, Kevin. I, I, I use them on my Monday meetings. Hey, um, if, uh, if you guys ever want to, uh, Kevin, when you're doing your Monday meetings, I'd love to see how you guys do that. I know it's a topic with the uh, National Painters Group, the PDCA, that uh, there's actually been live in the, in the field training where guys have um, videotaped or, or uh, Facebook Live or Periscope their, their meetings. I would love to see that. Uh, even if, uh, if you don't feel like doing it public, I would, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to sit in on one of those and just see how you, uh, how you run your crew. Okay, well, thank you guys. Uh, if there's no more questions here, uh, thank you for watching this. Uh, all my videos will be archived on my Facebook page, uh, Nick Slavic, and they will be on all of my uh, my YouTube page as well. They're all archived and they're and they're numbered, so you can watch them successively. And uh, I do list the topics on there too. So if there's a specific topic you're looking for, uh, painting cabinets has been a very popular one. Uh, you know, uh, restoring front entry doors has been another popular one. It's there. Uh, have a listen. Uh, send in your questions during the week. If you have a topic suggestion that you'd like me to expound upon, I'd be happy to do that. Send me a topic. I'll go through my archives, find some examples and some things for you, and then we can go from there. So thanks again for watching, and we will see you next week.